Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we're talking with ex-big law recruiter Sadie Jones about when and how to change direction in your job search. Your Law School Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan, and typically I'm with Lee Burgess. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so that you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website, Career Dicta. I also run the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review or rating on your favorite listening app. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can always reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we would love to hear from you. With that, let's get started. Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we're talking with ex-big law recruiter Sadie Jones about when and how to change direction in your job search. So welcome, Sadie. Thanks for having me back. My pleasure. All right, well, let's jump in. When might this be an issue? Like, when might someone need to change direction in their job search? Well, I think if you're at this point uh, and you're kind of halfway through the year and you still don't have a job, or even if you're just past OCI and you still don't have a job, I would consider changing directions. Yeah, I mean, I think basically if what you're doing or what you have done hasn't worked, (laughs) you've got to think seriously about what you're going to do going forward. Exactly. I think the, the key at that point is to kind of not blame outside forces and kind of look internally what's going on, what's not working, especially if it's not worked with, you know, a bunch of different employers that you've applied to. Um, you kind of have to look at what's going on with yourself. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if OCI hasn't worked out or you've been applying a lot of places and your applications are going nowhere, you know, I think you've got to get real about this. Like to continue doing the same thing is probably not going to get you the results that you want. I mean, one thing too that I think people need to look at is where is the in the process are you failing? So, you know, it may be something that's fixable, say if you are submitting applications, you're getting interviews, but you're not converting those interviews, that might be a different problem than if you're just sending out a bunch of applications into the void and getting absolutely nothing back. Exactly. I think if you're in the first position uh, and you're sending or if, sorry, if you're in the second position, you're sending a bunch of applications out, you're not getting anything back, uh, then I think you need to look at who you're applying to. Maybe you're applying to things that you're either not qualified for, um, you know, not, not someone that they're looking for, and then I think you need to reevaluate where you're applying. So I think that's kind of a different issue than you're applying, you're getting interviews, and nothing is converting to a job offer. Right. I mean, obviously not everyone converts every interview, but if you're not converting any, that might be an issue with your interviewing skills because obviously they're interested at that point. The other thing, I guess, is to look at how many places you're applying or how many places you're getting interviews because maybe that's not enough. Like you said, they're not all going to convert. So you need to kind of cast a wide net. Yeah. I mean, I think you can think of this almost like a marketing funnel. You know, you've got to have like a really big top of that funnel because it's going to, you know, say you apply a hundred places, maybe you get an interview at five or 10 of them. I mean, even that, you know, maybe one of those converts. So you've really got to be applying a lot of places to give yourself a decent shot as you move through that funnel of being the one person who pops out at the end with the job. Exactly. And I think, you know, it takes a lot of effort on your part to get there. And I think you kind of have to keep your eye on the big picture here, which is that getting a job is kind of the point of all of this. So you need to put, you know, as much effort into that as you are really into school, especially if you're a 2L, you know, and you're, you're not going to get your second summer job. That's, that's crucial. Yeah, and I think sometimes people are unrealistic about just the volume of places and the volume of places that are actual reasonable possibilities that they need to be applying. Like, it's probably not, you know, 10 or 20 places. It's probably in the hundreds. Exactly. And I think you need to be very straight with yourself about what your grades are, where you're in law school, you know, who you're going to be attractive to, and not just kind of what your dream is. You can look at that down the road once you have experience, but... Um, you need to be honest with yourself about, you know, who's going to be interested in you. Yeah, exactly. I think it's all about being realistic, particularly when it's one of your first jobs out of law school and you just don't have a lot to go on. Um, I mean, I guess the other 
other situation where people might find themselves needing to change direction is when something external has changed. So, you know, maybe you need or want to be in a location that's different than you expected when you started law school. Maybe your interests have changed. You know, you worked at the DA's office and realized you hate it and that's not going to be your path forever. You know, these things happen. Maybe you hated your summer position at a law firm or you didn't get an offer. You know, these are things that may convince you that you should be looking in a different direction. Exactly. And I think, I mean, even those external external forces could have changed from, you know, when you were doing OCI or when you were initially applying a few months ago, you know, maybe a family member sick, maybe your significant other got a job somewhere else. Um, and I think, you know, there is still time to make that change. And if anything, I think that can be an easier change than the, you know, this just isn't working out scenario. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, because it's sort of more explainable. Um, and it's probably easier, like sort of personally and emotionally, um, yeah, exactly. you know, to say like something else changed. Um, you know, it's not necessarily going to be easy to make that switch kind of halfway through the year, you know, or more. But I think if you know that that whatever that changes that's happened, that you, you know, are really committed to whatever the new thing is, I think you just um, need to stay really focused and on top of it and say, like, what am I doing to make, you know, this happen, you know, whatever the change is. Yeah, I mean, I feel like almost anything is possible, but you've got to really sort of make that commitment and go for it. I mean, for me, for example, when I was clerking, I was clerking in Boston, and I couldn't decide before I was clerking or while I was clerking, I couldn't decide was I going to work in San Francisco or work in New York. So this went on for like a year. Um, you know, I was talking to career counselors and people about it, and we were going through all the pros and cons. I just couldn't decide. So I applied for jobs in New York because it kind of seemed easier and it seemed like the thing that made the sense at that point. I talked myself into it and I had some offers. And I was getting ready to take one and then I woke up one day and was like, what am I doing? I really want to be in San Francisco. So I had to kind of start all over, um, you know, at the very last minute really at this point. And, you know, in the end, like I didn't have a lot of options, but I did make it happen. And I think that In that situation, you also want to be careful about what the story is that you're putting out there because the thing you don't want them to get the impression about you is that like you're constantly going to be changing your mind and they're going to, you know, give you a job for another location and then you're going to, you know, pivot. So I think the key is to make it really clear that this is what you want. And it doesn't necessarily have to be what you want forever, but that's what you're selling to the employer. Um, I know, you know. Now. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was a pretty easy sell. It's like, I cannot survive another winter on the East Coast. I need to return to California. (laughs) And And it sounded like you'd really done some soul searching and realized that that was important to you. And so I'm sure that came across. Um, And you had good qualifications. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Um, And it was also before the recession. Yeah, so I think that's something to keep in mind. But I also think that all of this is possible. um, And a lot of it is sort of you know, what your story is and how you're framing all of this. Yeah, exactly. So I think I agree with you. I think that second scenario of something external has changed is much, much easier emotionally for people. Mm -hmm. Because this first scenario where, you know, you're doing your best, you have an idea of what you want, you have diligently applied for these jobs and it's just not working out. That's really hard. And I think people have a really hard time accepting that it might be time to do something else. And this is where I think you need to sort of put your pride aside um, and, you know, look at things realistically. And I think that can be really hard for people. Um, I've definitely seen students who, you know, didn't get a job and are sort of bitter about it. And you can feel that. Um, And that's not going to attract anyone else to give you a job. So, So I think you need to really take, you know, a good look at where you're applying, what's going on in the interviews. You know, there's so many different levels of this where you can make a change and do things differently. But you can't do any of that if you're not being honest with yourself. And I'm not saying that that's easy, but I think it's something that's necessary if you want to get a job. Yeah, exactly. I mean, just continuing to do the same things that aren't working is probably going to keep not working. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, what do you think, what signs are you looking for if somebody comes to you and they says, okay, you know, I've done my best, but this doesn't seem to be working out. When should somebody basically give up on finding this dream job? Well, I I think if you, again, are way past OCI and you're past winter break and maybe you're into spring break, I think that probably by halfway through the year, you need to pivot in terms of, am I going to get the thing I really want? And you need to say, like, I need to get a job. Um, And I also think that there's probably a point where you move from whatever you really want, your dream situation to, you know, I just want to find something, you know, with really good experience sort of in the area I want. And then I also think there's probably a time where you say, I need a job and it has to be legal related and it just needs to be the best thing that I can get at this point. So I think there's probably two different steps, but I would say if you're a few months out from when everyone was interviewing and you don't have a job, that's where you need to at least switch to the, you know, it's not going to be what I was really looking for. You know, it's not going to be big law or it's not going to be whatever it was that you were really, that you had been applying for. Yeah. I mean, I think you have to accept at some point that ship has sailed at least for now. Um, and, you know, start triaging really of like, okay, how can I make this situation better than it is? Because the worst case scenario is that you end up not doing anything, not getting any work experience. And that is going to be a serious disaster when you're looking for your next job. Like, you know, that that is what you do not want to happen. Right. And I think, you know, it's going to be disappointing. It's going to be disappointing to to make the pivot and to kind of give up on a certain type of position and and maybe you still send things out, you know, if you if you can make that work and sort of have the time. But I think you need to be realistic and focus on something that you can get. Um, And maybe something that wasn't at the level of the original jobs that you were looking at. Um, And that's the only way that you're going to find something else because you can't keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting that all of a sudden, some firm is going to say like, here's a job offer. Yeah, I mean, that could happen, but it's highly, highly unlikely. Um, I was actually going to ask you, you mentioned this briefly, I mean, do you think people can or should keep doing a parallel search where they look for that ideal job, but then also consider other options? Or is that just really a waste of time at this point? I think that you can do that if you feel like you can fit it into your schedule and it's not going to hurt either your, you know, your schoolwork and the other responsibilities you have or the job that you're, the job search that you're switching to, you know, whatever that pivot was. So I think if you feel like you can realistically fit in some time to still do that, I don't necessarily think that it's a bad idea, especially if it's really just sending out applications. You know, I don't think that's a huge time commitment. Or maybe having some coffees or looking back at your kind of network or, you know, going to some you know, kind of mixers or, or whatever it is that's more in that original area. But I also think that if you feel like that is going to get in the way of other things, then you need to just focus on the getting a job part. Yeah, I agree. I think, again, like, you've got to be realistic. If you're like, oh, I'll do a parallel search, and then you spend 80% of your time doing the original search, and then 20% kind of occasionally sending out some other stuff, that's probably not the right ratio here. So maybe you need to really budget out your time here and say, you know, I will not spend more than X amount of time on the, you know, the parallel search or the original search and stick with it. So that means maybe you don't get to do it or you don't get to do it as much as you would want to. Yeah. And in terms of signs, I mean, I think of it almost like a legal research assignment. You know, when do you know that you're finished doing research? Well, it's when you start seeing the same cases over and over again. Mm -hmm. You know, so with this job search, it's like, well, if you've really exhausted all of the possibilities and everything that's showing up is something that you've either already considered or already applied for, people that you've already talked to, you know, in your network or whatever, you've probably exhausted the possibilities. You know, like there's got to be new stuff or there's no point in continuing. Exactly. Because, you know, again, I don't think something is going to magically happen out of nowhere. And, you know, there are the exceptions. Um, And I still think it's worth looking like, you know, let's say you're talking to career services and they mention there are some firms that didn't fill their summer class or something like that. You know, why not apply? But again, just don't waste your time and resources. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. And whose advice should you trust here? Because I feel like sometimes people 
you know, you're talking to all these people, maybe you're talking to career services, you're probably talking to family members, maybe friends, maybe classmates, people you know. I mean, you might be getting all kinds of advice, everything from, you know, it's never going to happen, give up, to like, you're a genius. Of course someone's going to want to hire you. Like, whose advice do we trust here? Um, I guess I, out of all of that, I would probably not listen to like your parents or something like that. I mean, there's a chance that they're in the industry or you have the kind of relationship, but they're going to be realistic with you. But I would be concerned that they would either be on the side of you're so great, you're going to find something or like, you know, there are the really pessimistic people who are really close to you. Um, so I think that they're probably not the most kind of objective. So I would say, in this situation, I do think career services tries to be realistic with people. I don't think they're the only person to listen to, but I think that they're a good resource. Um, you know, it might be helpful to talk to classmates who are like above you and have been through this and maybe people who had trouble getting a job the first time so you can hear other people's stories. Uh, but I would say you want someone who can be fairly objective in this situation, especially let's say if you're asking them to look at your materials or, you know, see what your interviewing skills are like. And here's a situation where I think we've talked about this before, but like recording yourself and you looking at it or having somebody else look at it who's objective. So that's what I would say. You don't want to get someone's advice that is so close to you. Um, that they're not going to be able to look at it uh, objectively. Yeah, and they have to know something and have some understanding. I remember my mother was convinced I was never going to get a job coming out of Columbia, and I was just like, really? I don't think that's (laughs) accurate. Yeah, there are situations, I guess, where there are people close to you who, you know, are lawyers and maybe do understand how it all works. Um, So, you know, so I think, you know, you can listen to them. Um, but I think you need to know that they're being straight with you because that's what you need right now is someone who's going to be honest, even if it's not going to be happy news or, you know, it's not going to be just what you want to hear is what I would say. Right, exactly. Because basically what you want to hear is you've got a job. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> but unfortunately, no one has a magic wand they can wave to get you to that point. Um, yeah, and I think this is also a case where calling in a professional might help, you know, somebody who Absolutely. can give you that objective advice. If you're at a point where you're like, I just don't know what to do. Like, I don't know why this is not happening. You know, somebody who can say, well, you know, this is how you're coming off in an interview. Like, you need to work on this. If you're willing to hear that. That's a hard, yeah, and that's a hard thing to hear. And again, I think a lot of students are defensive um, about that. And what I would say is, if you want a job, that's just, that's not the way to go. Um, so again, maybe it's something you don't want to hear, but maybe it's something you need to hear. Um, and it's going to make you better in the long term. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if the feedback you're getting is that you're coming off like a jerk in an interview, well, Mm -hmm. that's probably something to work on for your life. (laughs) Exactly. And I would go further than that and, and want to know specifics, you know, ask them, what is it, you know, what is it about you that seeming like that? Because I have a feeling a lot of times it's not what you mean to be putting off. Um, like right. some of that kind we, of attitude can come from a place of insecurity. Well, and also I think we both have been reading or listening to the Michelle Obama book. And I thought I found it really interesting when she was doing, starting to do speeches and she kept getting this like angry black woman meme and everyone's like, oh, this is so unfair. And she did feel like it was really unfair, but she also went and watched video of herself with no sound on and realized that her body movements and facial expressions and things actually were kind of coming off that way. And so to her credit, she changed them. Absolutely. I, I, I completely agree. And I think there are situations where, you know, there might be stereotypes or preconceived ideas that are going to be put on you, you know, regardless. Um, and, and like you said, maybe that's not fair. And maybe some of the stuff would have sounded different or seen different if you were somebody else. But you're you. You're going into the situation as you. So I think you need to do whatever you can, um, you know, to put your best foot forward. Yeah. And, you know, there are lots of tricks that, you know, things people, if you come off as very young, for example, you know, there are ways that you can dress and things like that. I mean, all of this stuff is very unfair and should not matter, but the reality is it does matter. And, you know, if it's an issue for you that you always are perceived as being very, very young, then you probably, and it's not even just a female thing. I think it's more common with females, but I had a situation when we were at trial 
And it was a male attorney who was Asian and he was a partner and he came off like very, very young. And when we did the jury testing, they're like, oh, I don't know if I can trust this guy. Like, you know, he seems like he's a kid and he wasn't a kid. Like, he was a partner in a law firm and he got very upset about that. And people were just like, look, you know, this, it is what it is. And like, we need to deal with it. And that's a good point. This isn't just about getting the job right now. This is like a great opportunity to look at, you know, what you're putting out there and, you know, cause I have a feeling that it's going to come up down the road, you know, and it's going to, it's going to keep coming up. So if anything, I would take it as an opportunity to kind of work on things. And yeah, I agree. I mean, I remember somebody who like wore fake glasses, um, which sounds silly. And I'm not saying that necessarily you should wear fake glasses, but I will say that she came across really different. Um, and it, uh, Lee you know, definitely did that. Yeah. On that headshot. <laughs> I mean, it really does put out, you know, something different. And I don't think it does for everybody, but I think things like that, you know, it's something to consider. No, I mean, her theory on it, she's like, look, I'm like a young, I'm a young looking blonde woman and I want to be taken seriously. Mm-hmm. So it makes me look more academic if I put on these very thick black glasses and you can go look at her first headshot, which is probably floating around the internet. <laughs> And she looks very serious and very academic, and it's because of the glasses. Yeah, I think it can make a huge difference. Or something else, it's not like you can change your voice, but I think some people, it's good to hear yourself, um, because I think there are things you can change uh, about how you sound or words you're saying over and over again or things like that. So I think that's something else to keep in mind. You know, for example, are you saying like a lot? Exactly. And that can be Whenever really I look hard. at the transcript for this podcast, I think I did not say like that much. And then <laughs> yeah. I listened to it and I'm like, oh, maybe I did. But I think they add some. It can be <laughs> it can be completely, you know, unconscious and just just these filler words. And I think, you know, getting rid of them can help. And so that's where you need to take a hard look at it. And it can be really hard. I don't think that anyone likes to hear themselves or watch themselves in these situations, but I think it's going to be helpful and actually give you a leg up over other people. Well, and I think you can also just think of having different personas. I mean, obviously I wouldn't go into a law firm interview and be like, Hey, what's up? You know, (laughs) exactly. Or what you're wearing, you know, like I would have on my very serious It may not be clothes that you, you know, your style or what you're wearing in your personal life, but it doesn't matter. This is about getting a job and kind of, you need to fit in in their environment. So Yeah, and I think this finding, and I think we've talked about this before, like finding some sort of authenticity in the middle of this very inauthentic in some ways experience is a really hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to balance. It's something you'll probably be working on for the entire time that you are a legal professional. Um, But it is something that you may as well start on because you're always going to be judged by people and you're always going to have to respond to criticism and decide which pieces of that you take on and which pieces you don't take on and what kind of persona you want to present. And this is a really hard balance. Absolutely. And I think that some law students focus on, oh, it's not fair. Um, And that is not helpful at all. And like you said, you can take on what you want. You know, you're being judged about something and you can say, that's what they're doing. You know, I'm not going to take it personally. I'm not going to, you know, internalize that. That's just what's happening. Uh, you know, maybe it's not fair, but life isn't fair. (laughs) So I don't think that dwelling on that is helpful or or taking a stand or anything like that. No, and I think it's an opportunity for self-reflection. You know, you can say, what am I willing to take on or not take on? What am I willing to put up with? And maybe this is not the right environment for me. And that's another reason to look for a different type of job is if you're doing these interviews and you're not getting results and you're feeling really uncomfortable that can actually be a great sign that this is an opportunity to change direction to something that is a better fit for you. Like not every job is the right fit for every person. I completely agree. So sometimes making this switch and this pivot is what you actually want to do because this isn't working out. Uh, So it's not necessarily, you know, taking a worse job or kind of losing your dream job. Maybe it's saying like, why did I pick this in the first place? Is it just because that's what everyone told me to do? Yeah, exactly. Uh, like I'm realizing this is not the right environment for me to be in and be comfortable and be like a full-fledged human being. Yeah. That's actually really important. Ab- absolutely. The other thing is, I think what we're talking about here is, you know, people who have had 
you know, many interviews and things aren't working out, you know, everyone has an interview that doesn't go well, or a lunch that doesn't go well, or makes a mistake or says the wrong thing or is late or, or whatever mistake it was. And so, you know, everyone has that happen sometimes. But I think it's different if you see that, you know, nothing is working out and nothing is coming through, especially if you've gotten the interview. So you've probably gotten through the initial kind of qualifications part. Uh, so really at that point, it's kind of them getting to know you and trying to figure out if you're a right fit. So again, like you're saying, maybe it's that you're not a right fit for this. Well, and you might end up somewhere better. I remember reading yeah. Justice Sotomayor's book and she didn't get a law firm job over the summer. And it was basically like, she thought it was a cultural fit thing that she just wasn't kind of what they were looking for in terms of background. And she did okay for herself in the end. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's such a great attitude, you know, maybe that is not what she thought at that exact moment, but obviously, you know, reflecting back, um, you know, so I think that's, that's great. And that's what we should all strive for. All right. Well, let's switch gears a little bit because we're about out of time. Um, so regardless of the reason that people are regrouping, whatever it is, how should they go about, you know, starting this process? Well, I think you need to say, okay, this is what I was, you know, applying for before um, and kind of, so like we said, switch gears. So say like a list of new places or new areas or, you know, so if you want to work at a law firm and you've been applying to all big law, maybe you say, okay, I'm going to research what are all the medium or small size firms in the area, um, that kind of thing, or you're going to look at public interest options or, or whatever different, you know, place it is. So you kind of need to uh, be specific and do some background work about uh, where you're applying. Um, I also think you need to go back and look at your resume, cover letter and all of those things. Uh, make sure that they're in order. Um, make sure that you know what the story is that you're portraying to people um, I think this can be really tricky in this situation, especially if things hadn't worked out, um, because you might have a lot of feelings behind that. So you need to be honest with yourself and probably once you work on the story, um, talk to a professional, talk to career services, talk to anyone that you can and see how it comes across to people before you use it. Because they might have suggestions, you know, this right. doesn't really I think make we sense even have a podcast me. on your story, so you could go listen to that. I think that is going to be key in this situation. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, you've got to have something that makes sense, but also something that you can tell, um, you know, confidently. I think you've also got to think about getting whatever emotional support you need to give this plan a go, whether that is a coach, someone for accountability, you know, a friend's group, maybe a therapist to talk about your frustration so that they're not coming out in interviews. <laughs> yeah, I think that is so important. And that's probably a step that a lot of people miss. You know, I think that fits into, you know, we talk about self-care a lot. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's actually a really key part of this. Because like you said, if you are feeling bitter about this whole experience and then you come off as bitter in the interview, like no one wants to hire a bitter person. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. Like whatever this job you're applying for is, it's actually an important role that someone is really looking to fill with someone who's competent and excited and you need to be that person in that interview. Absolutely. And I will tell all the students that we can feel on the employer side when students feel that way. Like there's just no way to hide it if you haven't sort of worked through those feelings um, because I've seen it a lot. And I think that that's a situation where the students probably don't realize that that's what's coming across. Yeah, of course. I mean, you think that you're like faking it, but you're not really convincingly faking it. Exactly. Another key um, thing I think is to go back and look at your network. Um, and we've talked about this before, but really, you know, who do you know? Who can you expand out into? Who can you have coffee with? Uh, because I do think that is so important in the job search. And maybe that was an area where you were weak the first time around because you thought you were going to get something during OCI and that didn't work out. So I think really carefully looking at that, looking at LinkedIn, looking at, at anyone you might know, um, even the undergrad you went to, alumni, local bar associations, things we've talked about before. But I would go back and say, am I doing everything in all of these areas that I can? Because getting 
you know, your name and your story out there, I think could be, you know, the difference between getting a job or not getting a job. Right. And you might need to rebrief people too, if you're changing Mm -hmm. direction. So say that you had coffee with someone in the fall and you're like, yes, I'm gung ho on being, you know, X and X hasn't worked out. So now you're going back to them and you're saying, oh, well, you know, actually that really hasn't worked out. So now I'm thinking of doing this, you know, that may be a conversation with your kind of key people that you need to have. Absolutely. And that's where you want to get your story straight and, you know, make sure that whatever, you know, the new thing you're trying, you know, makes sense and and all that. And people understand things change, you know, not everything works out, you know, everyone's had that happen. So, so I don't think you should be afraid to talk to people about it. Yeah. And I think people will actually respect if you say, Hey, you know, I know that we talked about how I really wanted to do X and I still would love to do that. You know, if you have any options, let me know, but that hasn't worked out. So I think I need to be realistic and shift directions. For sure. I would respect somebody talking to me about that Um, and not just selling me sort of a super fake story. Um, You know, it can be kind of obvious, um, you know, when it's not when it's not genuine or or something like that. I would rather someone, you know, tell me that they're switching directions because, you know, they're very motivated. They want to find something. Yeah, it just makes you look like a mature person who yeah. can handle disappointment, which, I mean, that's a skill set in itself. Yeah, and that's really what this is all about. Yeah, exactly. It's not going to be the first time and probably not going to be the last time in your life you're disappointed and have to switch directions. Um, yeah, I think that's all great advice. I mean, also, I think you just need to make a solid plan and really start blocking out the time to focus on this and then just get started. You know, sometimes people think like, oh, I've got to have the perfect plan. I've got to have the perfect list. It's like, no, you just need to start doing something and then see how it goes because then you can iterate, you can adjust your strategy, you can repeat, you know, that kind of thing. You're going to be repeating this whole process probably. So I think just getting started is probably the, one of the most important factors here. Absolutely. Because I think the disappointment can kind of hinder getting started. Um, So that's why you deal with that. And then, you know, you move forward. And, you know, that's all we can do. Yeah. And there's sometimes fear around rejection and things like that. Well, if I, you know, subconsciously you're thinking, well, if I don't actually send out the applications, they Mm -hmm. can't reject me. But it also means they can't hire you. So, you know, feel the fear, but do it anyway. And I would say that wasting time here is only going to make things harder. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's there's literally no benefit to not getting things out the door. I mean, as Seth Godin says, you just have to ship. So I think that applies here too. You know, even if your resume might not be the world's most perfect resume, if it's as good as you can make it in that moment, send it out. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, holding on to it and and thinking that, you know, things are just going to magically change. That's not that's not most likely what's going to happen. Something isn't just going to fall in your lap. It's going to be that you did work to get it. Like it's going to be hard work. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be hard work, but it hopefully will pay off in the end. And if you don't do the work, it almost certainly is not going to pay off. So you may as well get started. Yeah. And I think all this stuff, networking, everything we're talking about, it's going to help you going forward, you know, past even this 2L job. I think all that stuff is going to be great. So think of this as an opportunity. Yeah, if nothing else, it's an opportunity to develop job search skills, which are always useful to have. All right, well, unfortunately, with that, we are out of time. Thank you for joining us, Sadie. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. For more career help and the opportunity to work one-on-one with us, including on your job search strategy if you need to change direction, check out careerdicta.com. If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review and rating on your favorite listening app because we would really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to Lee or Allison at Lee at LawSchoolToolbox.com or Allison at LawSchoolToolbox.com, or you can always contact us via our website contact form at LawSchoolToolbox.com. Thanks for listening. We'll talk soon, and good luck finding a job.